tonight. Lethal landslides. Over 150 dead in India's Kerala state with yet more buried under the rubble as rescue efforts continue to dig through. Aiming to kill. Hamas says its political leader Ismail Hani has been killed in Iran's capital Tehran, the country vowing to take revenge on Israel. Beating the heat. The Olympics faces new challenges in the form of heat waves that threaten to cause a hindrance to spectators of the Games. Hanging in there. A feline friend finds themselves in a furniture fumble and is rescued by delicate teamwork. All that and more as World Is Tonight starts right now. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News this Wednesday evening. There are a number of key updates to bring to you tonight, starting off with the landslides in India. The death toll from the massive landslides that have hit the southern Indian state of Kerala has now crossed 158, with officials saying more than 220 people are still missing. Rescue workers say they are searching under collapsed roofs and debris of destroyed houses for possible survivors. Landslides swept through tea estates in southern India's Kerala state on Tuesday, killing dozens and leaving many missing, authorities said. The hillsides collapsed following torrential rainfall a day before, sending rivers of mud, water and boulders onto homes in the Wayanad district. Most of the victims are tea and cardamom estate workers and their families who were asleep at the time in makeshift tents. Nearly 350 families live in the region and some 250 people had been rescued so far, state officials said. The state's chief minister told a proper death toll is difficult to establish as many body parts have been spotted in the river. Rajesh said those rescue efforts were hampered due to a collapsed bridge near Churaumala, which links the disaster zone. Army engineers were roped in to help build an alternative bridge, the chief minister's office said in a statement. The weather office said there was extremely heavy rainfall over north and central Kerala so far on Tuesday, with more rain predicted through the day. It's the worst disaster in Kerala since 2018, when heavy floods killed almost 400 people. And over to updates on the war in Israel now. Hamas has said its leader Ismail Haniyeh has been killed while staying in Tehran. The group blames Israel for the attack. Israel has yet to respond. Haniyeh's death comes hours after Israel says it killed a senior Hezbollah commander in a strike in the Lebanese capital, Beirut. This comes as Masoud Pesachian was sworn in to start his fourth year term as Iran's new president, succeeding Ibrahim Raisi, who died in a helicopter crash in May. Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh was assassinated at around 2 a.m. on Wednesday. That's according to Iranian media, who also say he was staying at a special residence for war veterans in North Tehran. Hamas called the strike a severe escalation that would not achieve its goals. A senior Hamas official claimed Israel was responsible, though Israel gave no immediate comment. Iran's Revolutionary Guards confirmed Haniyeh's death in Tehran only hours after he attended a swearing-in ceremony for the country's new president. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas strongly condemned the killing of the Hamas leader in comments reported by Iran state media. Meanwhile, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said he was seeking to cool rising tensions in the region. However, Austin also said the United States would help defend Israel if it were attacked. The news comes less than 24 hours after Israel claimed to have killed the Hezbollah commander it said was behind a deadly strike in the Israel-occupied Golan Heights, complicating chances for a ceasefire agreement in Gaza. Senior Hamas official Sami Abu Zuri told it is a grave escalation intended to undermine Hamas's resolve, adding that the group are confident of victory. Haniyeh, who is normally based in Qatar, has been the face of Hamas's international diplomacy as the war set off by the Hamas-led attack on Israel on October the 7th has raged in Gaza, where three of his sons were killed in an Israeli airstrike. Appointed as Hamas's leader in 2017, he often traveled between Turkey and Qatar for ceasefire talks or to talk to Hamas's ally Iran. The International Criminal Court Prosecutor Office requested an arrest warrant for him over alleged war crimes at the same time it issued a similar request against Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. 
Criticism is mounting against Venezuela's authoritarian leader Nicolas Maduro after deadly protests erupt across the country following its disputed presidential election. At least 11 people have been killed in the protests and Venezuelan authorities say nearly 750 people have been arrested. Protests erupted across Venezuela Monday, shortly after sitting President Nicolas Maduro was declared winner in a disputed election. Their results were met with doubt in Washington and beyond, and independent pollsters have called the official numbers implausible. In the Caracas neighborhood of El Valle and the city of Maracay, police fired tear gas while protesters blocked roads. A large statue of late President Hugo Chavez, a mentor to Maduro, was torn down in the city of Coro. And in the pro-government stronghold of Katia, there was a traditional Lasso protest, banging pots and pans. The United States in 2018 called Maduro's re-election at that time to be fraudulent. His most recent win cements his third term in office and extends the Socialist Party's 25-year rule. Throughout the years, Maduro has presided over an economic collapse, the migration of about a third of the population and sanctions imposed by the U.S. The Venezuelan Electoral Authority said Maduro won 51% of the vote on Sunday, but independent pollsters say it was a decisive win for opposition candidate Edmundo Gonzalez. Gonzalez has repeatedly warned against bloodshed. However, on TV Monday morning, Maduro claimed paid agitators assaulted electoral agency officers. Shortly after the results of Sunday's election were announced, opposition leader Maria Corina Machado said the opposition won 73.2 percent of the voting tallies. Maduro's rival, the former diplomat Gonzalez, spoke to an audience. The opposition's numbers are sharply different to the country's electoral commission which called the election for Maduro with 51% of the vote. Machado called on supporters to gather in front of UN offices in Caracas on Tuesday, while Maduro's campaign manager has called on their supporters to march Tuesday as well. Venezuela's defense minister has warned against allowing a repeat of the, quote, terrible situations of 2014, 2017 and 2019. In those years, anti-government protesters took to the streets and hundreds were killed. Over in the Korean Peninsula now, North Korean drones have been a major security concern for the South in recent years. To better respond to these threats, the country has developed new laser weapons to intercept the drones. A drone catches fire and crashes into the sea. It was intercepted by a laser emitted by South Korea's newly developed high-energy laser weapon, about a kilometer away from the drone. It has taken five years and cost around 63 million U.S. dollars for South Korea to develop the new weapon, aimed at detecting and destroying small unmanned vehicles. Laser weapons are not only quiet and invisible, but they only need electricity to operate, making them cheap, costing less than $2 per shot. South Korea is expected to become the first country in the world to officially deploy and operate laser weapons. Seoul's decision to develop and deploy laser weapons comes after Pyongyang's drone provocations in recent years. In 2014, North Korean drones equipped with digital cameras were discovered after crashing near the border in Paju City, in Pyongyangdo Island. Then in 2020, five drones from the north flew across the border and breached South Korean airspace, sounding an alarm over the security threats posed by unmanned vehicles. The laser weapon is designed to shoot down small drones for now. But the country plans to develop it in the future so that it can emit more powerful beams, strong enough to counter aircraft and ballistic missiles. Japan's central bank has raised the cost of borrowing for only the second time in 17 years as it tries to normalize monetary policy in the world's fourth largest economy. The Bank of Japan increased its key interest rate to around 0.25% from the previous range of 0% to 0.1%. For more on this and updates of the country we have with us, other than a world news special correspondent, Rasita Chandradasa from Tokyo in Japan. As expected, the BOG announced their policy changes today, and it was something that we've been predicting over the past few months. They increased the short-term interest rate to 0.25% from the existing 0.1%. So this was like 25 basis point up from the current percentage. And 
uh, the market actually uh, reacted in a very positive way, even though some people have doubted uh, any in increase of the interest rate would might have a negative impact on the market. The Nikkei had a very good run today. And also some of the analysts uh, today, they, they pretty much said that this would be a very good for the consumers. And people might wonder why this low interest rate would be an impact. And it is due to the staggering savings, consumer savings they have in Japan. It is said to be over 1,000 trillion yen. That's a gigantic number. So that means people would be getting more money, more interest for their savings. And this would also have, could have a negative impact on their short term and the long term loans, especially the housing loans. So this is a concern that people are raising. So only the time would tell how the, uh, the interest rate would really impact their loans. So overall, the BOG's announcement came as not much as a surprise. And this is an election year. So that means this may well be the last step over the interest rate within this year. And the action was expected because mainly not just because of the economy, it's because of the very weak yen. So over the years, over the past few months, especially the yen has got weaker against all the major currencies. But just after the announcement, Ren yen, Japanese yen reacted very strongly against the dollar. It went up against a dollar like uh, for like a few yens per dollar. So it was a positive sign. And also the positive sign is the stronger yen did not impact the markets. So with the election year and the BOG probably will keep a mute on their policies. So the people are expecting what would be the next step because the Japanese economy badly needs some uh, pushing uh, because they've been lagging far behind some of the other big economics for past few years. Over to you. Thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandrasa from Tokyo in Japan. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And on the road to the White House tonight, with 98 days left till the election, Kamala Harris made it clear that she still hadn't decided on a running mate. The latest polls show Harris edging Trump and coming to a near tie. But the sentiment among certain key voter demographics remain wary of Harris and the future she promises. Tonight, Vice President Harris heading out to the crucial battleground of Georgia as her campaign zeroes in on a key decision. Who will be her running mate? Overnight, one top contender taking his name out of the mix. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper saying this just wasn't the right time to be on a national ticket. Another possible contender, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, also out on the stump campaigning for Harris. Harris's decision happening at warp speed. Her campaign just over a week old, but she's already expected to announce her running mate next week. A source familiar saying the two will then hit several key battlegrounds together. Harris is hoping her pick will build on her early momentum, even as Donald Trump looks to calm the controversy swirling around his running mate, Senator J.D. Vance. Vance under fire for his 2021 comments denigrating adults who don't have children. Overnight, Trump coming to Vance's defense. All he said is he, he does like, I mean, for him, he likes family. I think a lot of people like family, and sometimes it doesn't work out. And you know why? You don't meet the right person, or you don't meet any person. But you're just as good, in many cases, a lot better than a person that's in a family situation. But today, new comments surfacing from Vance's past, explicitly attacking the character of people who don't have children. Tonight, Vance on the campaign trail in Nevada, filling the more traditional role of a running mate, the attack dog. Kamala Harris was the most liberal member of the United States Senate. And thanks to the people in this room, she is never going to be the president of the United States. Harris firing back, challenging Trump to show up to their debate in September.
updates on the assassination attempt on Trump now. The new acting Secret Service chief says he cannot defend the security failures at Trump's Pennsylvania rally. Ronald Loeb's admission of a glaring security lapse came a week after the former director, Kim Burley Ketel, resigned. Tonight, Acting Secret Service Director Ronald Rowe grilled on Capitol Hill, calling the security gaps that led to the attempted assassination of Donald Trump a complete failure. Describing his visit to the scene. What I saw made me ashamed. I cannot defend why that roof was not better secured. Roe displaying these images, which he says is the view that a local sniper team could have had, which he believes would have enabled them to see Thomas Matthew Crooks before he opened fire. The gold arrow indicates where the shooter fired from. Why was the assailant not seen? The acting director admitting a Secret Service counter drone system, which could have detected the shooter and his drone, failed during the critical hours before the shooting. I have no explanation for it. It is something that I feel as though we could have perhaps found him. We could have maybe stopped him. The women's and men's Olympic triathlons will go ahead in the French capital. Poor water quality in the River Seine had forced the cancellation of training swims and the postponement of men's triathlon. And on the court, in an early tennis upset, a medal favorite Koko Goff was defeated in straight sets by Croatia's Dona Vekic in a match that features emotionally charged moments and lengthy debate between the US star and the umpire. Here are some more updates on how the games are going now. Triathletes at the Paris Olympics on Wednesday were cheered on by a delighted crowd as the hosts gamble to hold the swim stage of the race in the Seine paid off. The Seine finally passed river water tests, ending days of uncertainty over whether the central Paris swim was viable after rainfall caused a rise in concentrations of infection-causing bacteria like E. coli. The decision to postpone the men's race at the last minute on Tuesday triggered anger among some athletes. Belgium's Martin van Riel wrote on World Triathlon's Instagram page, if the priority was the health of the athletes, this event would have been moved to another location a long time ago. The races going ahead will come as a relief for Paris authorities, who have promised residents a swimmable sin as a long-term legacy of the Games, with the triathlon a very public test. The gamble that the river would be clean enough was never guaranteed to pay off, as water quality varies widely day to day. Paris has spent $1.52 billion of public money on wastewater infrastructure to contain sewage and minimise spillage into the river. Mayor Anne Hidalgo took a dip earlier this month in a bid to convince doubters that the water will not make them ill. France's meteorological agency has issued a weather warning for Paris and the surrounding areas with storms and highs of 35 degrees Celsius expected as it hosts the Olympic Games. The agency put in place a yellow alert, the second of four levels for the capital as a heat wave brings searing temperatures to other Olympic venues across France. Just days after its opening ceremony was marred by heavy rain, the Paris Olympics is grappling with a different weather problem, the first heat wave of the summer. Temperatures are expected to reach 35 degrees on Tuesday. There are no plans as of yet to postpone any events because of the heat, even those in the south of France where temperatures of 40 degrees are forecast. But that could change. And for some sports, the sun is judged to be an advantage. Visitors to the games and commuters are being given free sun hats and fans. And the wide availability of free tap water is considered a godsend for many. Meanwhile, others have their own strategies for beating the heat. The good news is the heat in Paris, at least, is set to last only till Thursday, when temperatures will drop back to the balmy high 20s, making it an altogether more tolerable experience. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. A precious fluffy friend got itself into an unfortunate situation that required rescue attempts from careful hands. Thankfully, this story has a happy ending, with the little creature saved from the hinges of its accident. 
Can you hold this for me? Careful! It's the delicate rescue of a tiny, precious kitten trapped inside a recliner chair. Okay, 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 okay. The poor thing somehow got stuck. What's going on? My cat got stuck on the couch. This Alliance Ohio police officer was on patrol when the 911 call came in. And oddly enough, the kitten wasn't in its usual spot, say, a tree. When first responders arrived to free the family pet, they saw it was stuck in, in the gears of the electric recliner. Oh, okay, I see. They had to dismantle part of the chair. Can you hold this for me? A little boy helped by shining a light on the situation. Then they went to work like surgeons to gently free the kitten. Should just slide out. Yeah. There we go. No. <laughs> Oh, Loose. We got her. We got her. Oh, no. Phew. All clear. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Sina Maya Dunne will join you next with the nightly business report. Thank you for watching. Good night.